What's happening? <laughs> Wonderful. Great to see everybody. Uh, as per our tradition, let us thank our guests who are tuning in by Facebook Live and or the Transformation Church Live broadcast. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Also, let's welcome the men and women of our Correctional Facilities Partnerships. Appreciate y'all. Love y'all. And also to our guests here at Transformation Church 521, thank you so much for being here. I know for some of you, it was difficult to get out of bed today. And so we want you to know that uh, we're real people with real lives and there's real struggles. And we want you to know that we are glad that you are here. We're continuing our series, I'll Be Happy If. And every one of the messages we're building off of them. So I want to encourage you, if you get a chance, to go back and listen to the other three messages. And uh, we're going to dive into a new topic today that I think we all wrestle with. But before we do, we're going to need the Lord's help. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, I pray for us that our hearts would be open to your divine surgery. I pray that we would be sensitive to your spirit. I pray that as you communicate, that our ears would be open, our hands would be willing, and our hearts would be receptive. Lord Jesus, would you do only that which you could do? Display how beautiful and how great you are. May I decrease and may you increase. I pray this in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. Amen. So um, when I was in my 20s, um, I said, I'm never going to be that guy in his 40s for working out that I would walk. I said, I'm going to run sprints like a football player my whole life. Well, that's not true. I walk now. I mean, I'd be getting it. I haven't got some of those, those, uh, those hookah shoes with the big old, like the heels about this big, so my legs and back and feet won't hurt. And I'd be I'd be getting it, man. I still can't walk as fast as Vicky. Let me tell you, if you ever walk with my wife, she will hurt you. Your hip flexors will blow out. It's amazing. I've never seen anything like it. So anyway, so we're in Montana on vacation, and it's just gorgeous. First of all, no humidity. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and then you've got, everything looks like a painting, the the beautiful mountains, and I mean, you just, I'm just walking, my headphones are on, it's great, I'm, I'm doing it. And then I observe a phenomenon that, that we all observe, but we don't really think too much about it, but it got me thinking. And here's the phenomenon. Dogs would bark and chase cars. So I thought to myself, what would happen to that dog if it actually caught the car? It would get run over. Often that's what happens to you and I when we chase power. We bark, we chase, we catch it, and when we do, we get run over. Now, here's my point. When I say position of power, I'm talking about positions of influence, which means all of us have influence. For some of us, we go, man, I, I'm ready to be a girlfriend. Are you sure? Well, I, I'm, I'm ready to be a boyfriend. Are you sure? Because understand this, what you give to that person is one day what they're going to take to the altar when they marry someone else. Well, I want this job. Are you sure? Because the responsibility of that job requires something. So oftentimes we, we say we want something and we catch it and it runs us over. I've been there. So listen to this, please, please, teenagers, listen to this. Everybody, listen to this. Please make sure your character is ready for the platform you're seeking. Please make sure your character is ready for the platform you're seeking. I'm going to say it one more time. Please make sure your character is ready for the platform you're seeking. For some of you, you want to be in politics. Man, that's great, but don't sell your soul. Make sure your character is prepared. For some of you, you want more responsibility. You want this job. You want to do this, this, this career. Make sure your character can sustain it. 15 years ago when everybody was saying, Derwin, you need to be a pastor. No, I didn't. 
I would have destroyed a church. I wasn't ready. So make sure your character can, can, can sustain the platform and influence that we want to have. We're going to look at two of Jesus' disciples who, like the dog, was barking for power. Now, before we get on Jesus' disciples, which is easy to do because we've read the end of the book, we go, man, how in the world did they not understand? The same way you and I don't understand. Think about it. They had Jesus beside him, and most of us have Jesus in him, in us, and we still don't get it. Yep. So, check this out. Jesus' disciples were Jewish. In the first century Jewish context, the Jewish people were occupied by the Romans who were dominating the world. So don't think of democracy. Think of an iron fist of Rome. Lots of people got crucified in the ancient world. That was how the Romans kept people in line. And, and, and so Jesus' disciples, growing up Jewish, experienced oppression. And, and if you've ever experienced oppression, uh, um, you want power. I, I, I mean, ladies, aren't you tired of not getting paid the same amount that men get paid for the same job? Men, y'all need to be the first one clapping because y'all got some daughters. Once again, check this out now. The deeper you have experienced oppression, the more you want to help others get out of it. And so for these guys, they've been under the thumbs of Rome. And so to want power, to change the situation is a good thing. But then sometimes when you have privilege and you have position, you go, I like power. And friends, if you don't think there's privilege and position too big to fail, y'all remember that in 2008, 2009, banks were too big to fail, even though they created the circumstance. And I know there's people in the banking industry here. That's why I'm saying this, because I want you to change it. Regular common people lost homes. They lost 401ks. They lost everything. And CEOs got fired with a golden parachute of 25 million eating lobster and veil. I think Jesus Christ would say something about that. Powerful people make laws to protect powerful people. So maybe they wanted power because they seen the advantages of power. So let's dive into the story. We're going to look at Mark chapter 10. This is the first gospel written. They were on the road going to Jerusalem, and they were not an Uber or Lyft. They was walking. <laughs> and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were astonished, but those who followed him were afraid. What's happening there? If you read the verses right before that, Jesus had just threw out this bomb. He goes, listen, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich man is to get into the kingdom of God. Now, the idea is not about money. It was that rich man worshiped his money and not Christ. Matter of fact, I want each of you to be millionaires in here. You know why? Think about all the hospitals we, we could build. Think about all the hungry people we could feed. Think about the difference we could make in the world, okay? So the issue isn't money. The issue is what do you worship? And so the disciples were like blown away, like, wow, this Jesus dude is radical, Taking the 12 aside, so the 12 disciples represented the 12 tribes of Israel because Jesus was creating a new people of God that included Jews and Gentiles with a new name called Christian or followers of the Messiah. Then taking the 12 again, he began to tell them the things that would happen to him. He's like, yo, fellas, come here, come here, come here. See, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man, teenagers, the Son of Man is the divine title for Israel's Messiah. He's their hero. He's their deliverer. He's going to be the one to set them free, and Son of Man is one of those titles. You'll find it in Daniel chapter 7 around verse 9. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and scribes. This is the Jewish religious and uh, legal elites. And they will condemn him to death. So Jews, by law, couldn't kill another Jew. So what do you do? You let the Romans do it because they're good at it. 
Matter of fact, the Romans had a PhD in killology. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles, the Gonim, that's the Romans. And they will mock him, spit on him, flog him and kill him, and he will raise up after three days. Check this out. Jesus is saying, now fellas, you've seen what a crucifixion looks like. You've seen Jewish boys line the streets and you know how they are humiliated. Crucifixion was not to kill you fast. It was a message. It was a message to say, don't get out of line with Rome. So before Jesus was cru crucified, they, they spit in his face, crown of thorns on his head to, to mock him. And, and then he was, he was flogged. Mel Gibson got close, but a man was flogged naked because in the Middle Eastern culture, to be naked is a sign of shame. So not only did they want to kill him in a slow, deliberate way, it was for humiliation. So Jesus is like, fellas, this is what's going to happen to me. Are you listening? Have you ever had an intense conversation, but you had an idea of what you wanted so much so, this becomes a big word, that cognitive dissidence kicks in. Cognitive dissidence is a word that psychologists use, and it means this, you hear it, but you disconnect it from reality because you don't want it. And so Jesus is like, here is reality. They were like, no, if I have power, I'll be happy. And that leads to this. Unholy ambition will put holes in your soul. Unholy ambition will put holes in your souls. Unholy ambition will put holes in your soul. Uh, let me give you an illustration. So football season is here. I told you I'm getting a little jumpy. So if I clothesline you in the foyer or in the parking lot, don't feel bad. I, I'm just feeling good. You know, I'm wearing one of my conference championship rings. I'm feeling it. Football season start and I'm ready to go. I just told my son in the back, I'm running sprints this week. I don't know why. This is football season. I got to do it. <laughs> Let me give you an illustration. So this is my first NFL trading card. Man, I, was, I carried this thing around everywhere. I got a trading card. You know, as a kid, you see trading cards. Then as an adult, you got one. It's cool. By the way, the older I get, the more impressed I am with what I did. It was pretty cool. Anyway, <laughs> here's the part that I want you to get. Like, ambition is good. I want everybody in here to be ambitious, but for the glory of God. Let me see that again. Be ambitious, but for the glory of God. Be ambitious for the glory of God. 1994, I'm a starter in the NFL. Second year, man, I'm starting. We play in Tampa Bay. The first game, now I'm so old, the first game of the year in 1994 was against the Houston Oilers. Houston Oilers. Houston Oilers. Oh, this ain't Texas, never mind. <laughs> Y'all like, I don't know what you're doing, Derwin. Never mind, never mind. Anyway, they don't even exist anymore, but nevertheless, that first game, my first NFL start, I led the team in tackles. Man, I was hitting them like they stole some. It was great. It was glorious. So I'm like, this is going to be easy. So the next week, we travel down to Tampa Bay, and they're running a play called a slip screen. So you don't even know what that means other than, need to know what that means other than this. My job as a safety was to protect the deep part of the field. So I observed the formation that they were running that play against. And they caught it twice. And I was like, coach, I see what they're doing. I can intercept the ball. I'll never forget it. He looked, he looked at me and said, Derwin, do your job. Do not try to intercept that pass. That is not in your zone. I'm ambitious, baby. I'm looking at, it, I'm looking at him like, like, like this. Okay. But my body <laughs> was telling me no. So they came out in the formation. It's third service. You get R. Kelly in a sermon. He needs to be arrested. Anyway, okay. Um, let's pray for R. Okay. So anyway, so they come out in the formation. I'm like, oh, yeah. And they, 
the, the running back loops out to take the linebacker there. The tight end comes up, and he's getting ready for the slip screen. I'm like, boom! I ran. And the quarterback, Craig Erickson, who eventually became a teammate, looked at me, and he went, pump fake. I went here. The tight end, Jackie Harris, went there, and the ball's in the air, and he scores a touchdown. Now, I wanted to get an interception because I wanted to be on ESPN. Well, guess what? I was on ESPN. <laughs> I was running after Jackie Harris while he scored a touchdown. My ambition cost us the game. My ambition also cost me a starting job. And it took me two years to gain the trust back of those coaches. And here's the sad part. For two years, guess who I blamed? The coaches. Well, they didn't like me. Well, everybody else makes mistakes. One of the first signs of immaturity is you blame other people. Well, let's continue the story. James and John, John and James, the sons of Zebedee, approached him and said, teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask you. Isn't that the way we pray? That's kind of like your two-year-old asking you, mom, dad, do whatever I ask you to do. How many of us would follow that advice? Most two and four years old don't know what they need. Neither do we. How about God? What would you like your will be done? I trust that more than I trust me. What do you, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus is playing along because he already know. What, what do you want me to do? He, he asked them. They answered him, allow us to, to sit at your right and, and at your left in glory. In other words, Jesus, man, we have seen the way you've made the dead get up and dance. Jesus, we have seen you moon walk on water. Jesus, we have seen your wisdom. Jesus, you got great crowds, man. How about we sit at your right and sit at your left and share this power? Jesus like, now, did, did y'all hear the part about uh, suffering, being mocked, uh, being killed? Did, did, did y'all did, did hear any of that? Are you familiar with the term helicopter parenting? It is not a 21st century phenomenon. It happened in the first century too. Look at this. This is Matthew 20, 21. One of the reasons why we know that the gospels self-authenticate and are true is you have different writers sharing different perspectives of the same event. So Matthew is gonna give us a little insight on this conversation. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons approached him with her sons. So it just wasn't James and John who approached Jesus. Mama grabbed one on the right and mama grabbed one on the left and we are gonna go talk to Jesus. You know how it is. Well, why isn't my son playing in the game? We're gonna go talk to that coach. Now you ain't been to no practice. You don't see how, how, how little Johnny don't pay attention to the coach, how little Johnny don't hustle. Oh, but little Johnny gonna play in this game. No, he ain't. <laughs> or, or, well, I'm gonna call the boss. Your son's 25. You don't need to call, he's 25. Cut the cord. She knelt down to ask him for something. What do you want, he asked her. Promise, she said to him, that these two sons of mine may sit on your right and on and the other on your left in your kingdom. Now, not, hey, Jesus, are they humble? Are my, are my boys humble? Do they have the spiritual fortitude to serve difficult people? Like, are they relying on the spirit? Mm -mm, mm -mm. Jesus, if you let my boys be right, you know, because what that means for mama? Shoot, she the first, first lady of the church. <laughs> Do 
Check this out. And let me say this before I get to this point. We all want the glory, but we don't want the suffering that builds the glory. We, we, we all want the, I do and you do, we all do. We all want the glory, but not the suffering that builds the glory. It's like, hey, I want to have a good marriage, but I ain't going to counseling to fix my issues. It's just going to happen by itself. That's like saying, I'm going to drive my car, and when the gas run out, it'll keep on going. <laughs> by the way, some of y'all driving cars that ain't moving nowhere because the gas has run out. If you want to lead, you will suffer. If you want to lead, you will suffer. Hey, dads, when you get married and say, I do, the Bible says you're to love your wife as Christ loved the church. How did he love the church? He gave up his life. He gave up his rights. Wives, what does that mean? Man, gosh, I, I could do this career or I could spend more time with my kids or it may be the husband playing that role, but there's always sacrifice for all of us. As a matter of fact, the greater your responsibility, the greater your sacrifice. Being the boss actually means you have less rights than everybody else because more of what I do influences more people. If you want to lead, you'll suffer emotionally, You'll, you'll suffer sometimes physically. For some of you, you're getting ready to go back to high school and you're leading the way and people are, oh, you're, you're straight edged, you're square, you don't like to drink, you don't like, I mean, your life is just boring and you get hit with all that stuff. Let's continue the story. Look at this, look at this. <laughs> Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. You, 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 don't, you, don't, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink? Teenagers, in the Old Testament, the cup meant, are you, are you ready to experience the suffering I'm gonna experience? Or to be baptized with the baptism I'm gonna be baptized with. He goes, guys, I just told you, I'm gonna go to Jerusalem, they're gonna mock me, they're, they're, they're gonna spit upon me, they're gonna beat me, eventually they're gonna kill me. Now, I'm gonna raise again on the third day, but man, them three days are gonna be long. Look what they said. We are able, they told him. What happened to them on the night Jesus was betrayed? They all scattered. But you know what? His unconditional love brought them back. I am so glad that Jesus is not just the God of a second chance. He's the God of a third, a fourth, a fifth, and a sixth chance. As long as hearts are repentant and willing, his grace never stops flowing. Jesus said to them, you, you will drink the cup I drink. Every one of the disciples except for one was martyred and killed for their faith. And the one who didn't get killed, he got sent to an island called Patmos, to live there by himself, which actually may have been worse. And he goes, you will be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. Here comes one of God's big butts, y'all. Here comes a big butt, and you cannot lie. Watch this. But to sit at my right or left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those for whom it has been prepared. He's like, mama, you don't know what you're asking. James and John, you don't know what you're asking. You want to be at my right? You want to be at my left? I'm going to spare you that. This is one of these nuggets that comes from just digging the scriptures and digging and digging. Look who was to the right and to the left. He, he goes, you don't want to be on a cross to my left. You, you, you don't want to be on a cross to my Right. True leadership and true power 
is servanthood. It's, it's servanthood. I propose, and teenagers, listen, listen to this, I propose that a lot of examples that we see as leadership is not actually leadership. The godly kind of leadership is actually servanthood. It's not, I'm gonna tell you what to do because I'm the boss. Leadership is influence to influence others to become something what? A leader tries to embody what you want others to become. So Jesus, the perfect leader, says, okay, you want to see what leadership looks like? This is what it looks like. When the ten disciples heard this, they began to be indignant with James and John. They're like, yo, James, John, what y'all doing? Why y'all trying to move into positions? Why are you manipulating Jesus? Don't you know we want to be at his right and left? How you beat us to it? <laughs> Jesus called him over and said to them, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. So he goes, okay, now listen, you have an illustration of what not to be. Look at how the Romans lord over their power. And those in high positions act as tyrants over them. He goes, that's not the idea. And what you guys are doing is that. But it is not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to be great, you want to be great? You want to be great? If you do, we all can be great. Whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant. Oh, no. That word servant is diakonos, where we get the word deacon from. And, and in the first century context, a servant was someone who served because they wanted to, not because they had to. So if you want to become great, this is what it looks like. And, and whoever wants to be first, he, he's, he's like, fellas, you want to be first? Like, like you want to sit at my kingdom and what it looks like, here it is. And whoever wants to be first among you will be a slave to all. That's the word doulos. That is the lowest common slave. So you really want to be great. You really want to have power. Power is unleashed to help the powerless. It's the opposite of what we so often see. Um, a couple of years ago, I was a coach on a football team. And one of the things that's important as football players is you got to be in shape. And so as coaches, you try to simulate what's called conditioning. And you got times that the players need to make. So if any one of the players don't make the time, it doesn't count. And you all have to do it over again. And so like, like on most teams, you got some guys who are faster than other guys. Well, the guys who were faster and maybe in better shape continued the win, but the sprint did not count because their teammates didn't make it. Y'all may be going, man, that's so unfair. Actually, it's not because when you play football, if you're the quarterback, what happens if the offensive line doesn't block? You get sacked. If you play defensive back and you're trying to cover a really fast guy, and the defensive line don't get pressure, what happens? You get burned. Football is a team sport. Teamwork makes the dream work. So if four of y'all make the time, but 12 of you guys don't, nobody makes the time. So in between the break, I, I pulled the guys aside. Now keep in mind, at this point in my life, I was on the all-time San Antonio football team. I was a team captain in high school, team captain in college, team captain in the NFL, played six years in the NFL. So I think I earned the right to be heard. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say I got a little bit of street cred? So I said, now look, look guys, you guys keep winning the race, but your teammates don't and the laps don't count. So like, I'm like, I know you're fast, but what I wanna know is when things get tough, can you encourage your teammates? So instead of winning the race every time, get next to a teammate and cheer them on through the line and then we'll all finish. That's what a team does. And they looked at me like, and they didn't do it. No, it's, it's actually sad because in most games, 
in the fourth quarter when it got hard and you got tired, guess what? Fold it up. Shut it down. You know why? Because that's what they did at practice. I'm going to get mine. We got too many folks like that. I'm going to get mine. <laughs> no. It doesn't work that way. And, and, and so my thing to them was this. You're more of a leader by sacrificing winning so your teammate can finish. So here's my question to you. When you wake up in the morning, is it infused with servanthood or is it, how do I get mine? Who can I manipulate to get to where I want to get? Or are you waking up going, who can I help finish across the finish line? Because no matter how big your house is, whatever car you got, whatever station you have, how much money you got, you're not living. This is what life looks like. It looks like servanthood. Now, we do want to be Christians, right? Yeah, that's the Bible. Teenagers, don't sell your soul. Begin now to say, how can my life be poured out to be great? True leadership is redemptive. Uh, true leadership is redemptive. Um, the word redemptive is a Jewish word, and it means to set free, and it comes from the Exodus when God used Moses to set the children of Israel free. And so true leadership is how do we set people free? Well, that begs the question, teenagers. Set free from what? All of us are born with this sickness called sin, this this virus called sin that makes us dysfunctional. Now, if you don't think you have sin or have ever sinned, we have great psychiatrists here at Transformation Church that can help you. <laughs> like, like, we're all painfully aware that we've got this sin sickness. Well, Jesus comes to not just forgive our sins, but to heal us of that sin sickness and set us free from it. But not only that, he sets us free from the great enemy, death. One out of one people die. My mentor, his name's Alan Bacon, and when his dad was in either in the late 70s or early 80s, he was uh, getting ready to pass away, and he said to his son, Alan, and then Alan said, said, said this to me. He said, his father said, son, we're all in the checkout line. Some of us are just closer than the other and you don't know where you are in that. But because of Jesus' resurrection, through faith in him, you too will raise again, and death has been defeated. And through his resurrection, evil has been defeated. Not yet, but one day it will be, and until Jesus comes back, you and I exist to be servants who push the darkness back, not with our hands, but through the power of his nail-pierced hands. True leadership is redemptive. Jesus finishes up this section with this. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Let's pause here. Teenagers, everybody, those of you new to the faith. So the Son of Man, this is the Messiah. Throughout the scriptures, we see that the Messiah is worshiped like God, that Jesus is God in human flesh. In the book of Isaiah, a man named Isaiah saw the glory of God in the temple. That's where God's presence was. And it's, it was Jesus, John 12, 41. Isaiah saw Jesus, and it says that these beautiful, massive angels, all they could do was say, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And the, and the temple shook. It's, it's this Jesus who says, listen, I didn't come to be served but to be a servant. Wow. And how did he display his servanthood? And to give his life as a ransom for the many. That Jesus says, I'm going to give my life so that you can have life. And a part of having this eternal life is we become servants like our Messiah. In a moment here, we're going to celebrate communion. This is something that Christians have been doing for, for 2,000 years is 
On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he, he got bread and, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. This is what servanthood looks like. My body was broken for you and my blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins and a new covenant. Please understand this. God wants more than a personal relationship. I don't have a personal relationship with my wife. I have a covenant with my wife. A covenant is stronger than a personal relationship. There's the depth of commitment that interlocks and says, I do from now until forever. Our soul tattoo is this. Receive communion, receive the Lord's Supper. And as we receive the Lord's Supper, in essence what we're saying is, Jesus, thank you for serving me. Thank you for serving me to the point that I can have your eternal life and now I too choose to become a servant. Will you pray with me? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, the one who is the son of man who did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life away as a ransom for the many. It is in his name and through the Spirit's power that I ask that you would form our hearts into servant hearts, that, that we would use the power through the platforms you give us to set the powerless free. I pray that you would tenderize our souls with your mercy I pray that you would unlock your divine potential to live through us to be your hands and feet, not because we have to, but because we want to, we get to. May we serve each other in our families. May we serve each other in our lo local churches. May we serve each other wherever it is that we go because you first served and loved us. Now, right now in this moment, I think there's some of you, there's many of you here saying, um, Pastor, I listen to what you're saying and I want the life that you just described. I want to experience forgiveness. I want to experience your power. I want to experience newness of life. If that's you, today's the day to say yes to Jesus. His nail-pierced hands are extended. Blood and all is dripping. His bruised and battered body is calling your name. Today is the day. Today is the day to cast off your sin. Today is the day to get rid of guilt. Today is the day to get a new power and a new hope and a new start. Today is that day. If you're ready to bow your knee to Jesus and say, yes, I choose to follow you in the silence of your heart, would you, would you say this to him? Lord Jesus, as I gaze upon you on that bloody, rugged cross, I realize that that should be me. But you got up there voluntarily because you came not to be served, but to serve and to be my ransom. Today, by faith, I accept what you've done. I accept your blood that forever forgives me. I accept your sacrifice that makes me clean. And I believe that on the third day you rose again to now live your supernatural life through me. Form my heart to be like yours. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.